Welcome to master class in critical care medicine from Ashoka Hospitals in collaboration with the ACCM Hyderabad chapter. So today's topic for discussion is the diabetic ketoacidosis and mucormycosis. The case will be presented by Dr. Uday Kumar and Dr. Vignesh. Both are DNB residents from Ashoka Hospitals in Hyderabad. And we have senior examiners, Dr. Deepak Govil sir. Uh, he is director and HOD Department of Critical Care Medicine, Medanta Hospitals, Gurugram. And another examiner is uh, Dr. Bhavani Prasad, is HOD, Department of Critical Care Medicine from K Hospital, Site XCB. Uday Kumar, you can start the case. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, coming to the case, uh, uh, this is uh, actually 43-year-old female, sir. She actually presented with complaints of right orbital pain and uh, right orbital pain and uh, right facial pain since three days and uh, with three episodes of vomitings and uh, generalized weakness since one day, sir. And uh, no history of uh, abdominal pain and loose stools. Background history of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, she is using metformin and glimepiride since seven years. And uh, she is non-compliant with her medication, sir. And uh, history of uh, COVID infection, and uh, she uh, on, home, on, on home isolation therapy one and a half year back, sir. Now coming to the examination, uh, uh, GAT per abdominis. Uh, just go back, go back. Now, can we discuss in between or we should discuss at the end? Dr. Yes, Venkat, what is your we should discuss? Like? We should discuss each slide, sir, okay. from the beginning. So I would like to ask two, three questions here. Why you have taken the history of abdominal pain and lose stool? What could be the differential diagnosis of any orbital pain, facial pain? Uh, actually, patient had uh, three episodes of vomiting, sir. Okay. Three episodes of vomiting, okay. just to roll out. Uh, so what uh, could be the differential? What comes to your mind the moment you hear that patient is having orbital pain, facial pain, along with vomiting? Uh, the differentials were uh, uh, sinusitis. Uh, sinusitis is a possibility, sir, and a headache, and uh, 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 any nasal blockade, and uh, upper respiratory tract infections, and uh, conjunctivitis, and uh, uh, and also uh, associated with vomitings. Uh, maybe a patient is having uh, some uh, generalized infection also, sir. So I would like to add a few things that the history should be a little more elaborated. We should have asked about the vision as well with the retroorbital, uh, right orbital pain. And uh, so the history of vision should also be asked. And then the history of uh, past medication is looking a little incomplete. It is only the, med uh, the anti diabetic treatment, nothing else. Yes. I asked for history, sir. Um, there is no usage of. Uh, uh, any immunosuppressive medications and uh, like steroids uh, in the COVID uh, during the COVID infection also there is no history of uh, immunosuppressive medications sir and no history oh. of organ transplantation and uh, vision initially it was good sir uh, yes sir okay please carry on yes sir. and uh, coming to the systemic examination. Uh, uh, GIT per abdomen is soft and non tender, and uh, CVS is S1 as to head, no murmurs, and uh, res coming uh, respiratory normal vascular breath sounds uh, with no added sounds, and uh, no significant uh, 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 neurological deficits, uh, and uh, only having a, a pain in the pain in the face and uh, over a region uh, over a right uh, maxillary region, and uh, uh, right eye pain, and uh, she had a, a double vision. Uh, uh, initially, it doesn't, she doesn't have any difficulty in vision, and uh, later uh, she developed a diplopia in unilateral. Yes, sir. So, if we are thinking of sinusitis again, two history, two point in history is also missing. One, any nasal history of any nasal blockade, whether this nasal is you know, she is having some nasal issues or not, because majority of the sinusitis, the starting point is the. Um, Maxillary sinus only could be. And another thing, what about uh, diurnal variation from morning till evening, whether the, this pain or swelling increases or decreases and what happens when she leans forward? So in the leaning forward, whether it is same or increasing, as we all know, the sinus pain sometimes 
exaggerate with the leaning forward. Yes. Okay. Please yes. move on. And uh, coming to the initial uh, initial data, uh, uh, vital data includes uh, BP a blood pressure of 100 by 50 millimeters of mercury, and a heart rate of 112 beats per minute and SpO2 and room air 96% on the room air sir, and uh, respiratory rate around 34 breaths per minute and uh, initial GCS was uh, 15 by 15 sir and uh, we have done ABG uh, initially it is showing a high anionic metabolic esterosis with raised lactates ABG of a, a pH of 7.106 and a PCO2 of 40 and a PO2 of 98 on room air and a bica value of 12.7 with the anion gap of 23 sir and uh, data gap ratio is 1.1 and the initial sugars were 474 milligram per deciliter and uh, when we uh, examined for urine ketones it was large and uh, initial uh, uh, lab parameters were uh, sodium was 132 and potassium was 4.1 and chlorides were 92 and uh, uh, calcium value is 7.4 and magnesium 1.4 and phosphate value is 3.1 and urea creatinine value sir uh, 1.2 and 96 and uh, hemoglobin initial hemoglobin was 11 grams and uh, uh, total leukocyte count was 9000 and the platelet count was 2.2 lakhs and uh, initial albumin values is 3.29 sir 3.9 so what could be the causes of uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis uh, coming to the high uh, causes of uh, differentials of high anion gap metabolic acidosis uh, Methanol poisoning and uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, and uh, use of uh, IN, INH and uh, ethylene glycol and alcohol poisonings and salicylate poisoning. These are the common causes of uh, uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Sir. Okay, please move on. Dr. Bhavani, if you want to discuss anything, please. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, see, if you go back to the history, uh, can you go back uh, regarding the history? Right. So here, uh, I, I'm sorry, actually, I missed some of the few slides. Uh, uh, if you see the history here, uh, we are focusing more on the orbital pain, right facial pain, and three episodes of vomiting, right? Yes. But uh, subsequently, when we go forward, you were uh, discussing about uh, high blood sugars and uh, agma, and the urine coat ketones being highly positive, right? Yes, sir. So, is there no history of any, you know, polyuria, polydipsia, uh, uh, any weight loss, uh, any history of why this got precipitated? So, those things need to be mentioned because when you are trying to focus on diabetic ketoacidosis as a predominant cause here, so, the, but the history is, I mean, whatever you are saying, your lab values, it's not getting reflected in the history. Yes. Of course, you mentioned uh, the respiratory rate of 33 or 34. He is taking but other features of, uh, you know, uh, HAGMA, other heat features of, uh, you know, going like having high urine, high ketones, high sugars, they are not there. Yes, sir. So you see your history and your labs and your diagnosis and your different they all should correlate actually. Oops. Move on, please. Yes, sir. And uh, initially uh, we have given two liters of uh, fluid bolus, sir. That is normal saline. And uh, initiated on uh, insulin infusion, initial potassium value is 4.1. So how and, much insulin will you start here? Uh, initially, we have, uh, we have started a according to 0.1 unit per kg bolus, followed by 0.1 unit per kg per hour infusion we started, sir. And uh, initial uh, fluid bolus given around 2 liters of uh, normal saline, sir. Followed by we have started of uh, 250 ml per hour, sir. 250 ml per hour plasma line. And uh, we continued fluid resuscitation uh, according to DK protocol uh, uh, around uh, uh, 250 to five, uh, 250 500 ml per hour initially. And the, as as upon uh, we continuously monitor sugar sugar levels. Uh, 
as sugar levels are decreasing less than 250 we uh, switched on to 5% we added 5% dextrose uh, and we continued insulin infusion and we closely monitor electrolytes also potassium and phosphorus values and um, uh, we continuously uh, frequently we monitored AB, abg values uh, we are monitoring the anion gap uh, initially it was a, a high high anion gap metabolic acidosis uh, upon fluid resuscitation and uh, fluid resuscitation and insulin insulin therapy uh, ketones urinary ketones were uh, negative and uh, anion gap is closed or, uh, at the end of second day so why it took so long to close the anion gap it, Yes. Any, uh... The patient came uh, previous day night, sir. So by the next day evening, the anandga was actually closed. So I'll rephrase the question: What is causing an anand gap here? Unmeasured, uh, uh, unmeasured anions uh, uh, causing the anand gap. Uh, like anand gap metabolic acidosis. Like. Like like uh, ketones, uh, ke uh, keto keto acids, uh, albumin, and uh, in this in this situation, the ketones uh, were secondary to uh, high sugars and uh, background issue of diabetes. So, how the ketones are getting metabolized? Uh, what is the role of insulin? Um, in case of uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, diabetes mellitus, and when, when it is poorly controlled, in uh, severe insulin. Uh, no, no, uh, I am asking how these ketones get metabolized. Yes. Uh, upon insulin administration, ketones were utilized uh, for energy source. Uh, it is absorbed into the cell and metabolized. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, sir. How it metabolized? It gets converted into acetate and look unless and unless it. unless you think about the metabolism, only then you can say that when the anion gap is getting closed. You said that the cause of anion gap is mainly the ketones, ketone body, and some other unmeasured things. So unless you understand how these ketones are getting metabolized. It will be difficult for you to assess when the anion gap will be closed. And the anion gap should be closed as early as possible because it is causing some other issues as well. Number two, what we measure and what are the different components of the ketones and what we measure. What we measure through lab and what we measure through the keto sticks. Which component is measured by the keto stick and which measure. Uh, component is measured in the lab. There are uh, three major uh, keto acids, sir: acetone, acetoacetate, and beta hydroxybutyrate. The one first uh, appears is beta hydroxybutyrate, and the last disappears is beta hydroxybutyrate. That is not uh, tested in uh, by routine uh, urinary nitroprusset test, sir. In nitroprusset test, only acetate and acetoacetic acid uh, are, are diagnosed. Uh, even even neg with negative uh, urinary ketones, uh, there is a possibility of a presence of beta hydroxybutyrate in the blood. Uh, we have to prefer our uh, urine uh, in the serum ketones over uh, urine ketones uh, to evaluate whether uh, ketosis is present in, or not. Dr. Bhavani, would you like yeah. to ask? Him? Yes, sir. So, no, I think uh, so. By this time, we have come to the diagnosis of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, right? Yes, uh, do you have any differential diagnosis uh, for this apart from uh, diabetic ketoacidosis? Uh, possibility of uh, 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 differential diagnosis for alcohol and uh, starvation also is the possibility of uh, uh, ketoacidosis. Sir. Uh, okay. So, how do you differentiate uh, between the diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, alcoholic ketoacidosis versus uh, starvation ketoacidosis. Nowadays, uh, there is a new fad of you keto can... diet. You know, yeah. you, you should also involve it as one of the differentials, probably, where ketones are positive in uh, patients, uh, in people who are taking a pure ketone diet. Is it not? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. How do you differentiate? The presence of a background history of a uh... Poorly controlled diabetes, or uh, maybe a, a, di a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus, 
uh, the, there is a possibility for uh, towards uh, uh, diagnosing uh, diabetes uh, related uh, ketoacidosis sir in case of starvation uh, blood sugar level may be uh, low and uh, maybe uh, the background history of uh, the um, starvation and the psychological factors uh, can be a uh, can be point towards the starvation also and uh, alcohol history can be taken by um, history by taken by the directly from patient or relatives can be taken sir sugars will be basically normal sir as compared to dka uh, the sugars will be basically normal in case of starvation and alcoholic ketoacidosis as well so that will be a reaching point to make a call correct, correct. but uh, but uh, a patient with uh, chronic alcoholism with chronic pancreatitis with high blood sugars can present with you right with uh, alcoholic uh, 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 ketoacidosis yes sir. so that that might uh, you know uh, confuse the picture right yes sir. so again uh, uh, history uh, background history uh, is uh, more important uh, any history of binge drinking in the last 2 to 3 days right yes. and uh, the acidosis uh, might not be as severe as diabetic ketoacidosis in uh, alcoholic ketoacidosis uh, the ph might not go up to 6.9 uh, uh, in those subset of patients if they go they uh, they won't be talking to you okay so coming to some of the things like uh, what do you think uh, uh, precipitated the condition for dk in this patient uh, possibility of sinusitis which is triggered uh, infection uh, uh, upper respiratory tract infections uh, is the triggering factor for uh, decompensation and also non comp she is non compliant to medication sir Uh, that is also a possibility uh, there is two risk factors for that in infection and non compliance to medications so as you have rightly written an iron gap closed at the end of the next day so it means that now we are following a patient up to next day any relevant investigation which you have missed in the initial phase or you have not mentioned here uh, and phosphorus values phosphorus values Hmm. Pardon. Phos uh, phosphorus value, sir. Anything else? Magnesium. And HB even C. Uh, Anything else? And uh, magnesium. Not electrolyte. Something else. And uh, we have done MRI uh, PNS, sir. A paranasal sinus, sir. Uh, that is in the next slide. Anything else? in a diabetic lady what could be the commonest cause of infection what is the commonest root of infection uti uti uts uti urinary tract infection. infection yeah yes so uti you have not done any urine culture or any routine routine uh, neither you have sent a blood culture if you have sent you should have felt in any diabetic ketoacidosis patient if for 24 hours if we are just trying to close the anion gap not working about the any infection then it is disastrous if the infection is not controlled probably we will never be able to control the the ketoacidosis so the blood culture urine culture urine routine x ray chest x ray pns or ct pns or mri pns they should be done within 6 hours of the stabilization of the patient Six to eight hours. I would suggest that as early as possible, you feel that patient can be shifted. These things should be done for CT scan. X-ray can be done at the PNS. I understand it cannot be done bedside, but X-ray chest and other blood culture and everything should have been done at early stage. Uh, for example, she might be having both the things: sinusitis as well as the UTI or even sinusitis. Unless we are giving. some i trying to identify some source and giving antibiotic it will be our source control in any way it will be very difficult to uh, control the ketoacidosis you were lucky that the canine gap was closed otherwise in presence of sepsis sometimes it is very difficult to resuscitate such patients and anion gap is like a uh, very difficult to close so you next slide please yeah, um, just to just to add sir govil sir yes uh, please yes please 
Govil sir actually pointed out a very relevant uh, factor here. Uh, you know, infection being the predominant cause of uh, you know precipitations of uh, DKA, uh, of which uh, the UTI and uh, pneumonia being the predominant cause uh, for the uh, for these subset of patients. Okay, so even though sometimes we should not be carried away by the initial symptoms or the initial presentation of what the patient is saying. So once you find out that the patient is having a DKA, uh, you should go according to your, uh, you know, the pattern, how to evaluate the DKA, right? So UTI and pneumonia being the commonest cause of infection, uh, not doing a CUE to see for pus cells uh, is a blunder at this point of time, okay? So, so just, uh, just uh, Dr. Uday Kiran, uh, just uh, what are the other causes do you know regarding the precipitating factors? Like, like uh, Govil sir has rightly pointed out uh, the infection being the predominant cause of precipitation, right? So there are some other factors also which can, you know, uh, uh, precipitate the DKA, right? You uh, some of them. Uh, apart from infections, uh, 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 ACS, uh, acute coronary syndromes and cerebrovascular accidents and uh, trauma, any uh, stimul uh, stress on the body, uh, like uh, trauma related and, uh, and also uh, non-compliance to medication uh, uh, are the major risk factors for uh, developing a patient into DKA cell. And any other things? You have mentioned about uh, you know oral hypoglycemic agent, glimiparate, right? Mm -hmm. SGL2 T inhibitors also uh, has been a proposed mechanism causing decay as well background cirrhosis as well adds to the listing. Yeah, you have to remember that nowadays uh, glyphosins have been predominantly prescribed uh, among the diabetic patients, and uh, they have the potential to cause decay both in type one and type two diabetes. Okay, so. Yeah, that's also an important aspect. Any other thing, uh, some patients, young patients, uh, sometimes do... Uh, IV drug abusers also can. Uh, yes, IV drug abusers, cocaine abuse mainly. Any other thing? Sometimes... Steroid is Steroid, yes. Drugs, drugs, drug history is very important, which I don't see in your uh, history, right? What are the drugs uh, patient was before? I mean, apart from the oral hypoglycemic agents. So was the patient on glucocorticoids? No. So was the patient on some uh, antipsychotics, uh, which uh, may sometimes precipitate the decay. Drugs are the predominant, sometimes uh, might be the precipitating factors. So drug history is very, very important, which we often miss. Any other things? Like Govind sir pointed out, uh, HbA1c my, we missed the HbA1c, right? So that gives a history of uh, you know how compliant the patient is to the drugs. That also you know might be the reason, apart not apart from the infection, you know non-compliance to the insulin might be also the predominant cause for the uh, precipitation of decay. Any other things? Beta blockers. Yeah, that's all drug history over. We'll move forward next. Any technology dependent, we are dependent on technology sometimes. Any technology malfunction? Insulin dose. Uh, Sorry? Insulin uh, dose, which is not getting properly delivered. That's okay. manual, right? That's not technology. Any man technology we're dependent on, which is not working. The sugar monitoring which is not Yeah, working. so the, the glucose monitoring strips may be uh, expired or strips may be mismatched with the glucometer that could give rise to the false reading. That's right. Yeah, apart from that, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, the malfunctions of the subcutaneous insulin pumps, right? So, we, some people, I mean, it's, I mean, now it's catching up, but uh, there are some people, some patients who are on insulin pumps. Sometimes the malfunction of the insulin pump can also precipitate decays. Uh, any idea about the uh, eugleicemic decay? 
those who are those who are on SGLT2 inhibitors like amphetamine and dapagliposone uh, used in uh, uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus and heart failure patients uh, there is a possibility of euglycemic uh, ketoacidosis sir uh, sugars will be less than 250 or less than 300 but uh, because of a relative insulin deficiency there is a fat lysis a lipolysis uh, is predominant which leads to ketoacidosis sir uh, that uh, that, uh, that is a new trend uh, uh, the new thing that is uh, euglycemic ketoacidosis apart from uh, routine diabetic ketoacidosis we are seeing Uh, yeah, what you said is right. SGLT two, SGLT two inhibitors patients on SGLT two two inhibitors may have an euglycemic, but the mechanism is little bit different. Not because of the lipolysis. Okay, it's not. It's not related to lipolysis. I suppose uh, it's basically related to the opening of the glucose channels in the uh, uh, in the in, in the uh, nephrons. Okay, so what happens because of that? Uh, there is a continuous loss of glucose, but the ketones are there. There is a lack of insulin. Uh, there is continuous formation of ketones, but the glucose is continuously excreted in the urine. So that is the reason why patient on SGLT2 inhibitors uh, have a euglycemic uh, ketoacidosis. Okay, so when you are using the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, you have to be careful. A patient with More than 65 years of age, patients with history of uh, prostate enlargement with a residual urine on G SGLT2 inhibitors, they are more susceptible to euglycemic ketosis. No, no, they are susceptible to UTIs. So, what does the SGLT2 inhibitors do? They cause glucose it's glucose in the just causing in the urine. Yeah. yeah. So we have to be very careful in patients who are. Uh, I know more than 65 years of age, having a history of BPH with SGLT2 inhibitors. So, any other causes for euglycemic decay, which you know, you said SGLT2 inhibitors. Any other thing? Starvation and alcohol. Yes, starvation can cause anything. Alcohol intake. Uh, Even pregnancy. Uh, pregnancy. Pregnancy. Pregnancy can cause. Yeah, and. Uh, Patients who are coming to ER with a history of they take they feel that uh, you know uh, they they uh, they feel that it is because of the lack of insulin. Some people they take insulin before coming to the ER, so they may also present with glycemic uh, uh, decay. Okay, go will sir. Sorry, please move on. Describe this MRI. Yes. Sir. MRI PNS done on uh, day one. It is showing uh, pancreatitis, sir. Pancreatitis, pancreatitis picture. Uh, showing uh, in this slide, we can see maxillary pancreatitis and spinal pancreatitis involvement, uh, and uh, hypertrophic tyrosinase also we can see. And uh, uh, we consulted uh, ENT ENT department, and uh, uh, patient on day three, patient underwent uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, and uh, in empirically initiated initially empirically initiated on a liposomal amphotericin B around five five mg per kg we in, initially started sir and uh, patient shifted from OT uh, on ventilator in view of uh, poor sensorium patient uh, sensorium is not improved from uh, anesthesia and uh, uh, we he is continued on mechanical ventilation therapy on day day three sir. And day four, day four also patient sensorium remains to be the same, and uh, with GCS response of E two M two, and uh, we done a uh, repeat MRI sir. Repeat MRI showing a uh, pontine infarct sir, uh, pontine infarct sir. Uh, and uh, we consulted ID ID specialist, and uh, we increased the dose of amphotericin B two ten mg per kg, on the day four, and uh, in when you go back. Can you describe this MRI? Although it is little um, difficult, but can you just tell me which sort of image is this? Which uh, MRI uh, DWA showing the hyper uh, intensity is uh, deficient resection in in the regions of uh, uh, pontine and uh, uh, these things. Uh, can you move the marker? 
just actually uh, not uploaded the entire video so only okay. one slide is there so so which are the area where there is a actually this or... area uh, this area we, we can see the high, uh, division restriction sir uh, so uh, it is showing a division restriction uh, in the basal ganglia and also bilateral basal ganglia and pontine uh, regions also sir Okay, move on. Uh, so, what could be the cause of this uh, sensorium loss here? Uh, initially, patient had uh, only sinusitis. Uh, that time, patient uh, sensorium uh, remains to be normal. Uh, that is GCS of 15 by 15. Then, uh, after surgery, patient uh, developed drop in sensorium. Patient uh, sensorium is not, uh, not improved. We are done MRI, but uh, possibility of uh, uh, fungal infection with involvement of endothelium, and uh, that is causing the uh, infox in the brain regions. And the migration. Why not, why, not hi, why not hypotension during surgery? Uh, that is also a possibility, sir. Hypertension and a possibility of uh, uh, invasive infection. Mm -hmm. Have you gone through the uh, anesthesia chart to identify any hypertension? Yes, sir. Uh, but there is no history of uh, hypertension and uh, hemodynamic instability during the entire. Uh, uh, surgical procedures. Okay, move on. Upon day, uh, day five to day seven, a patient uh, sensorium remains to be the same with M E two M two response, and uh, uh, patient underwent a uh, dacastomy on day six, sir, and uh, switched over to uh, BiPAP and followed by uh, switched over to thermovent and weaned off ventilator from a uh, day seven, sir. Tissue diagnosis confirmed that uh, the aseptic hyphae, which is uh, with uh, branching uh, acute uh, branching uh, perpendicularly, uh, it is seen in the tissue diagnosis, suggestive of a mucormycosis, uh, invasive mucormycosis. Uh, tissue diagnosis also confirmed on day seven. Sir. So, what is the dose of amphotericin B for mucormycosis? Yeah, uh, five to actually in case of. Uh, uh, only involvement of mild infections like sinusitis and uh, pulmonary infections and cutaneous uh, mucormycosis. We have to start for 5 mg per kg of liposomal amphotericin B, sir. And uh, in case of CNS involvement... Why not Why not plain uh, deoxycholate? And the possibility of uh, adverse, adverse profile is uh, involvement of... Uh, a possibility of AK is... Uh, with the deoxycholate, uh, there is a possibility of AK is more, sir. That's why we have preferred uh, liposomal amphotericin B and CNS penetration also more with uh, lipos liposomal amphotericin B compared with uh, conventional deoxycholate. Okay. So for mild and uh, other, you have said 5 milligrams. Yes. There is intracranial involvement, then we have to go up to 10 mg, sir. Mm -hmm. So, in case of uh, we had an infarct, we don't know the cause exactly. We, we thought that it would be an angio invasive form as well. So, we increase the hike up the dose to 10 mg per kg. How you give uh, liposomal amphotericin B? We diluted in uh, 5D, sir, and give it over uh, 5 to 6 hours. How much 5D? Sir? How much 5D? 500 ml of uh, 5 Okay. Whether it's a, five, a 250 or 500, the dilution remains same. No, so the dilution will get altered depending upon uh, the amount of uh, D5 we are going to use. Okay. Why we are diluting? What could be the side effects of li even liposomal amphotericin? So, one is. Uh, Reactions which happen during the infusion itself, it can be uh, starting from uh, febrile fever, chills and everything. Other thing what they have quoted is uh, when we give infusion on a prolonged dosage, it decreases the incidence of nephrotoxicity as well as being quoted. So it helps in both the ways. What else can happen? Any electrolyte disturbance can happen? Hypokalemia and uh, hypomagnesia has been uh, noted actually when using uh, amphotericin B. 
Okay. Sir, Dr. Bhavani, please. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so we have come to a situation where, uh, uh, you know, my patient is having mucormycosis. That's what you are trying to sell, tell because uh, the tissue diagnosis confirmed that, right? Yes. And uh, you are saying that it is a invasive ah. mucormycosis. Uh, why are you saying it's an invasive mucormycosis? Involvement of complete pan-sinusitis pan and uh, the cerebral involvement also uh, indicating that uh, it, uh, infection has migrated to brain, uh, causing endotheliitis and the secondary infarcts uh, are also seen in this uh, patient. Yeah, but your pathologist doesn't know that the brain is involved. So your tissue diagnosis confirmed uh, invasive. Okay. Right? So how did the pathologist come to a diagnosis? Pathologist doesn't know the brain. Angio invasion, angio invasion uh, as well as getting invasions. Yes, that's right. Angio invasion. So there is an invasion into the blood vessel. So that's the reason why we call it as invasive mucormycosis, right? So yeah, like we'll try to concentrate more on DKA. Uh, I'll come back to mucor again. Because before 2020, we never bothered about MECAR. Uh, now, DK was there since long time, right? So, your cases will be more concentrating on the DK. So, let's come back. And uh, uh, you, you didn't mention uh, any one important uh, uh, measurement or one important lab parameter uh, for you, which might be useful for your uh, uh, management. So, can you tell that? I'm oh, sorry if I have missed that, but you, I, I don't see anything, uh, any part of that measurement in your slides. And then gap, you, I think you have mentioned that's not an issue. Something I think very close to an and gap. Delta gap. Yeah, I think you have mentioned that. Mention about the delta ratio as well. Yeah, okay, fine. Delta ratio and N gap. Okay, they're all the sequel of that. Okay. You have come up to N N gap, you have come up to delta gap, that's fine. Sorry, yeah. So serum osmolarity. Why we missed serum osmolarity, right? Yes. How do you measure serum osmolarity? Uh, we into sodium uh, blood urine nitrogen by plus to 2.8 by uh, glucose by 18. Uh, we will measure uh, by this formula. We can measure the uh, measured uh, osmolalities. No, this is, this is calculated. This is a calculated, calculated, yeah, calculated osmolality. Osmolality. We send the sample to the lab and then uh, we look at the difference between the measured value uh, versus our calculated value, and this is helpful in calculating the osmolar gap. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. So, what is important is the measurement of osmolality. Okay. So, why why we are focusing on osmolality? And uh, there is a possibility of uh, uh, hyperosmolar state. Uh, and uh, hyperosmolar state may also associate with a key, mild ketone positivity. Uh, then we have, we have to rule out the hyperosmolar states. So, what are the difference between hyperosmolar state and the ketoacidosis? Uh, compared to uh, in DKA, there is a uh, associated acidosis and uh, bica value is uh, less than 18 and pH value of, uh, mostly in, uh, less than 7.3. Uh, in case of uh, hyperosmolar state, uh, pH remains to be normal. That is uh, more than or equal to 7.3 and bicar value also will be normal, sir. And uh, serum osmolality will be uh, normal in case of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is raised in case of, um, and that is more than 320 milliosmoles uh, in case of hyperosmolar state. And uh, sugars usually uh, tend to be more than 250 or 300, uh, more than 300 in case of DD, diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis. In case of uh, hyperosmolar state, more than 600 uh, can be seen. And uh, urine, uh, kidney involvement and uh, um, 
kidney involvement and the dehydration status will be more in the in hyperosmolar state and compared to the diabetic ketoacidosis okay yeah uh, can we calculate the osmolality in this patient uh, and you can can you tell me the osmolality in this patient uh, in this patient uh, osmolality was uh, 30 306 uh, calculated one and uh, uh, yeah that he excludes a hyper hyperosmolar state yeah, that's right so that's what osmolality measurement is an important aspect and uh, sometimes it might be useful in our uh, you know Uh, fluid resuscitation also right yes. so anion gap is one thing where uh, you target the treatment along with serum ketones uh, sometimes you need to target uh, the serum osmolality also especially in hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state so like uh, dr udaykaran you were trying for to focus more on the symptoms of uh, you know uh, mucormycosis in your history okay for the benefit of everyone can you tell me about the clinical features of how the dka patient presents and uh, usually uh, based uh, diabetes uncontrolled features like polyuria polydipsia and uh, um, abdominal pain secondary to acidosis and kusmal breathing can be seen and uh, respiratory rate usually more than uh, 30 uh, to wash out uh, for, for the respiratory compensation and uh, and also weight loss can be seen sir polyuria polydipsia and weight loss maybe uh, yeah we'll see in the history sir nausea and vomiting as well yeah. will be more common any other thing you miss something the most important aspect and the severe decay sensorium is going to be sensorium. exactly exactly neurological manifestations are also important so it might be late but you know it's not like we don't have this neurological manifestation like stupor coma in the subset of patients so if we see dk versus hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state which one has a predominant neurological manifestation hyperosmolar state should be having a predominant neurological manifestation but uh, dk in case of severe uh, acidosis say ph less than uh, 7 can also have neurological manifestation as well so why 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 hhs has predominant neurological manifestation because of, because of hyperosmolar state the increased sugars which is causing a shift of uh, fluid from uh, inside the brain compartment to the intravascular compartment in shape it's also a shrinkage of the brain that causes uh, neurological manifestation in hhs correct like depending on your history you said the history of 3 days right uh, there was it's not significant history uh, depending on the history can you differentiate between a dk versus hhs uh in case of dk there is a uh, uh, history will be uh, this is usually mostly acute in onset sir in case of hyperosmolar state it usually takes days to weeks to develop hyperosmolar states uh, based on the acuity of symptoms we can differentiate between the diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, hyperosmolar state right so uh, you said abdominal pain right what's the cause of abdominal pain in this subset of patients uh, ketones uh, and acidemia are the uh, major uh, because of these things abdominal pain is a possibility sir why other possibility could be uh, hypotension in this ischemia rare possibility hypoglycemia sorry i didn't get it a rarest possibility can be uh, uh, dehydration induced uh, steam on the vessels can also be how is that related to abdominal pain mesenteric ischemia the rarest why isolated mesenteric ischemia why not coronary ischemia or why not cerebral ischemia in dehydrated state uh, uh, switching of uh, i think uh, prefer- preferential circulation that is uh, abdominal lens uh, circulation is sw- switched over to the vital organs sir uh, renal and cerebral 
okay uh, not complicate this anymore so it's basically simple it's because of electrolyte imbalance mainly the potassium so what happens delayed gastric emptying ileus isn't it yes right so uh, you said uh, something about uh, order right what was the order you see in this subset of patient uh, ketone breaths uh... ketone breaths right yes what is that ketone you smell You have said earlier. I, I think they have mentioned fruity smell somewhere. Something which is metabolized by the lung, which is excreted by the lung. Ammonia. You smell ammonia. Ammonia doesn't. Ammonia is not fruity. I will. I will assure you that. So. Fruity odor. Yeah, what is that fruity order? What is because of what? Ketosis. Ketone. You have three ketones. Acetone. Yes, acetone is the one which is excreted through the lungs, which you smell. So Vinay, uh, sorry, uh, Uday, uh, depending now you have discussed right. Depending on the things what we have discussed. can you enumerate the diagnostic evaluation in this subset of patient okay 1 2 3 diagnostic evaluation how we have come to the diagnostic diagnosis of dk uh, routine investigations uh, cvp and uh, cue and uh, urea creatinine values and uh, serum osmolality and uh, abg to roll out uh, uh, acidosis and uh, urine ketones and uh, blood serum ketones uh, these are the uh, required investigations and uh, in coming to this patient uh, we need a uh, initial uh, x ray pns uh, or uh, directly go will go for a ct or mri pns uh, last yeah. two years we have seen so many mucor that is why the diagnosis of mucor or the suspicion of mucor is very high remember 5 years back this patient would have come to any icu everybody would have concentrated only on dk and the sinus thing would have taken care of the secondary i am sure that everybody must have started some sort of antibiotic to this patient and maybe another day one day or two day after once the patient is stabilized is stabilized only then he must have been shifted to the ct or mri so we can go back to the dk what are the how you manage a dk forget about this sinus thing or just put it in a back bencher that you have not noticed that sinus thing or you are not aware about the co complication of mucor mycosis if any patient of dk is coming to your hospital or to you how will you proceed uh, fluid management is the cornerstone of this treatment sir initially we have to give fluids uh, so you will go straight away to the circulation no abc yes sir Uh, airway breathing circulation uh, based upon the uh, uh, mentation of the patient uh, in case of uh, alter mental status we have to first uh, secure the airway and uh, then followed by uh, uh, circulation and uh, coming uh, fluids are the mainstay of the treatment uh, treatment sir uh, initially we uh, in case uh, if patient is not having any congestive heart failure and ckd features we have and uh, we can directly start with one yeah, i'll give you a set of uh, investigation his pco2 is around 20 or maybe 16 with the Actually, ph of 6.7 or 6.8 uh as we give as acidosis and uh, uh, acidosis corrected and sugars were corrected uh, the breathing pattern will uh, become normal sir uh, there is a no need of uh, connecting in non invasive ventilation for this patient sir uh, this is acidotic breathing rather than the lung parenchyma disease uh, so uh, we can avoid uh, this uh, niv initiation sir oh, i have not said niv and why should in a patient who is uh... having co2 in wash out anybody will give an iv and iv is 
the first line, the indication, first indication of NIV is the hypercarbic acid, uh, this thing, rather than uh, in patient who is washing out the CO2. But at this point of time, if his CO2 is too low, you have to carefully watch his breathing because this patient can any time go because of the very low CO2 in the respiratory arrest. We'll secure the airway first and take him on control. Ventilator. If patient is conscious, then maybe there is no need to secure airway. But if patient is drowsy, then probably we should secure the airway first. Then fluid, how, what, how you decide about the fluid? How you give fluid to these patients? Initially, fluids, uh, uh, one, uh, one to... Yeah, initial hours, uh, find it one, one liter of fluid bolus around the th in 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, normal saline can be given. And uh, uh, if, if there is no hemodynamic uh, so, uh, oxygen saturation drop, uh, we can continue fluid aggressive fluid resuscitation. And uh, we have to closely monitor the sugar values also. And uh, if uh, sugar values are uh, less than 250, uh, we have to supplement with 5% dextrose. Did you monitor anything else? You have not monitored the urine output of this patient? Yes. Anywhere you have not mentioned anything about the urine output. Her initial creatinine was high, her urea was 96, and creatinine was, as far as I remember, 1.2 or 1.6 something. Yes, sir. So we have not mentioned anything about the urea and creatinine. She might be having diabetic nephropathy or she might be having a, a early stage of CKD. Nobody knows. Yes. Yes. You're not. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have to constantly monitor the vital parameters and the urine output. Uh, along with, the, we can, uh, as fluid therapy goes on, we have to continuously monitor sugar values. And uh, the insulin infusion uh, with the initial bolus of uh, 0.1 units per kg followed by 0.1 units per kg per hour we have to start sir and be before starting insulin infusion we have to check the uh, baseline potassium values if it is less than 3.3 we have to correct the potassium and then we have to start the uh, potash uh, insulin uh, insulin infusion therapy and uh, uh, insulin inf infusion therapy targets were around uh, 50 to 75 drop of uh, GRVS per hour, sir. If it is uh, more than 100, uh, we have to reduce uh, the dose to offer. If it is less than 50, we have to increase by 50% of uh, baseline insulin dose. Uh, and uh, in case of uh, uh, blood sugars were le less than 250 milligram per deciliter, we have to reduce the insulin dose to offer, sir. And, uh, and when, also, you switch uh, off, when you switch off uh, or you move from infusion, uh, insulin infusion to subcutaneous, infu uh, subcutaneous insulin in these patients? Uh, that our target is uh, uh, closing a fanion gap and a pH of more than 7.3 and uh, bicarb, of, uh, bicarb value of more than 18. And uh, patient should be uh, uh, able to take oral diet. Uh, in these uh, situations, we can switch over to subcutaneous insulin uh, with uh, if a patient is on for nearly 5 ml of uh, this thing, uh, insulin infusion, we have to uh, start uh, uh, human actor paid around the subcutaneous uh, 10 doubling doubling of insulin infusion. The family, one of the family members says that patient, my patient is in diabetic ketoacidosis. Now his sugar is maintaining below 250. Why you want to give 5% uh, dextrose? You are just making money. One side you are giving insulin, one side you are giving 5% dextrose. You want to make money, keep him in the ICU, keep her in the ICU unnecessarily. How will you explain this point? And uh, patient, uh, if we stop the insulin, the patient may land up in, again into ketoacidosis. Uh, we have to target the serum ketone values and uh, uh, closing a fanion gap is uh, much more important than the uh, uh, targeting sugar cell. We have to target anion gap rather than sugars. So the right answer is unless ketones are uh, almost negative, like with the oral hypoglycemic ketones cannot be taken care of. So to metabolize them, we need to give insulin. Unless the ketones are not there, then... Yes. Yeah. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. Have you given any antibiotics to this patient or not on day one? Actually, uh, empirically, we started with third generation cephalosporin cell. 
and uh, along with that uh, um, uh, because her tlc was normal as far as i remember i think it was normal yes sir seven it was normal sir. normal sir. okay third generation cefalosporin we have given what else what other supportive drugs would you like to give if you would like to give anything else and uh, electrolyte correction should be should also be uh, no i agree electrolyte but any supportive drug would you like to give to this patient thymine pardon thymine uh... i couldn't understand please repeat time in sir is mentioning about time in sir time in acha time in time in sorry yeah time in anything else any dbt prophylaxis any stress ulcer prophylaxis we have to start actually dbt prophylaxis sir uh, Uh, low molecular weight heparin can be started uh, can be or should be or should be, should be started should be started whatever should be started sir should be started sir okay what about stress ulcer prophylaxis would you like to give anything or not yes after day of time of admission the patient in fact on day 2 the patient started having uh, oral diet and he was actually well even conscious as well to take oral diet so we didn't initiate any stress ulcer prophylaxis And the initial period, but uh, later period when the patient went on mechanical ventilation, and then we have to go for tracheostomy. That is the name we have initiated this patient on stress ulcer prophylaxis. So on day one, patient came with the history of vomiting. Even that time, you won't don't want to give any stress ulcer prophylaxis. Maybe it's okay. Anything or else, Doctor Kushal, Doctor Ravan Kushal? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, 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 we were mentioning about the diagnostic uh, criteria. Uh, Like you were mentioning about the CBP, you sending of various electrolytes, uh, uh, sending for the ABG to find out the anion gap. So we will try to di dissect it one by one, right? So what is the requirement for the CBP for you? Uh, to rule out any uh, raised in T TLC, sir, the possibility of infection, we have to rule rule out. Uh, And uh, we have to identify the source of uh, infection as soon as possible. Uh, yes, actually, we had a headache, uh, nausea, and vomiting with uh, orbital pain, which can be even an isolated migraine precipitation as well, sir. So to differentiate uh, the precipitating cause, in this case, we did a uh, TLC count as well to go. Correct. So the thing is, even if let's say this patient doesn't have any infection. Yes. But do you think that patient TLC will be normal in this subset of patients of DK? Possibility is still there, sir. Yes. So DK per se can increase through increase your TLC count. Yes. Doesn't mean that uh, you need to have an increased TLC count uh, for the diagnosis of infection. No, DK alone per person uh, with increased TLC. On the other hand. Uh, patients with increased TLC and no fever, you can't say that patient is not having any infection because these patients do not present with fever, fever, even though they are having infection. Okay, so let's come to. If you look at the investigation, investigation suggests that that urea is very high, and if you remember, urea is a very potent antipyretic. So, in presence of high urea, sometimes fever doesn't appear, even in the presence of infection. Please move on. Uh, uh, Sir, was saying something, Doctor Bawani. Yeah. Sir. So, let's uh, come to the electrolytes. What are the electrolytes you send uh, for uh, DK patients? Uh, routine uh, sodium chloride and potassium, and uh, also. Phosphorus values and magnesium values have to be sent. There's a possibility of because of uh, the polyuria. There's a possibility of hypo magnesiemia and hypo phosphatemia. Also, yeah, there's it. Right. So, if you come to the sodium, what is the predominant presentation of sodium in DK patients? Mostly mild. Mild hyponatremia will be seen, sir, because of uh, high sugars. Uh, we have to correct it by uh, 
for every 100 mg per deciliter uh, increase above 100 so we have to add our 1.6 of uh, uh, sodium to correct uh, uh, corrected to get the corrected value any idea about uh, pseudo hyponatremia you encounter in this subset of patient apart from that correction sometimes you might have very low values of sodium yes, do you know why this tend to happen in hyperproteinemia and hyperlipidemia, hypertriglyceridemia cases, sir. not with uh, hyperglycemia as far as I can remember. The two basically because of the laboratory measurement error actually. Right. So you mean to say, Dr. Vignesh, that you don't see pseudohyponatremia in DK patient? Yes, sir. No, it's a simple. No, sir. No, right. So, but you see, you see pseudohyponatremia because uh, DK causes lipolysis. Lipolysis causes hypertriglyceridemia. That will sometimes lead to pseudohyponatremia. That you have to remember. Yes. Okay. So what else? What happens to the potassium? Uh, because of uh, acidosis, high potassium value will increase, uh, but intracellular potassium value remains to be low. And uh, that is the thing, sir. Uh, in case of uh, acidosis, uh, possibility what of hyperkalemia. Yeah. What is the total deficit of potassium in decay patients? You see, we are talking about severe decay. So, we are ICU people. We are interested in moderate to severe decay, right? So, simple decays can be managed at ward or HDUs. Okay. We are interested in severe decay. So, what is the predominant potassium depletion in these subset of patients? What is the amount? Can you? Sorry, sir, not aware of the cutoffs. Yeah, so almost like 300 to 600 milli equivalents of uh, potassium they require, right? So over a period of time, we need to infuse that amount of uh, potassium. What is the reason for hypokalemia uh, in this subset of patients, apart from the uh, uh, any other uh, cause? What are the causes you know of? for hypokalemia in this subset of patients. Uh, polyuria and vomiting, uh, GI losses uh, were the predominant uh, cause of these things, uh, hypokalemia. Uh, and, uh, renal and GI losses. Uh. It's predominantly the urinary losses because of the glucose osmotic diuresis. It's predominantly the renal losses rather than the uh, UHG. So, what about the phosphate? Once we start correction, patient will end up in hypophosphatemia because of uh, the strand cell shift which is uh, happening. So, we have to monitor phosphate as well uh, near the end of uh, the correction. Right. So, phosphates, hypophosphatemia is a high possibility, right? Yes. Sir. And, uh, but the problem is uh, it's seldom so low that we need correction. So, but we need to monitor what are phosphates. If the phosphate, for example, the patient is showing increased muscle weakness or the patient is already intubated and you have a difficulty in weaning, try to measure the phosphate. And if the phosphate is less than one mg, you need to correct the uh, phosphate so that it helps in weaning of the ventilator as well. Okay. So, you said about the creatine levels. What happens to the creatine levels in this subset of patient? Because of hypovolemia, if there is any pre-renal component that the patient can have increased creatinine and urea as well in this particular case. Correct. So, pre-renal AK is the predominant cause. Any other cause? Hypertension and intrinsic kidney disease is also a possibility in this case. Okay. Fine. For a patient who is presenting, a 20-year-old presenting with DKA, presents with high serum creatinine. Once you correct the uh, the provided you, uh, you know, excluded the pre renal EK. Any other reason for uh, high creatinine? Diabetic nephropathy is causing CKD. Yeah, that's uh, apart from that, 20 years is a very young age to develop diabetic nephropathy, right? So it takes time for the diabetic nephropathy. And the background, uh, any infections? Uh is also a possibility. Correct. 
the possibility of sepsis causing increased serum uh, creatinine is a possibility, right? Any other reason? Any drugs? After not, not uh, do you have any drugs for this patient which cause increased creatinine? No, sir, not in this case. No. Yeah, we are starting the uh, amphotericin B afterwards, right? Not before. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. So, what are there any other reason? No, sir. We are out of. Yeah. So, do you know anything about uh, uh, astoacetic acid increasing the creatinine levels? No, sir. Yeah. So, you sometimes the astoacetic which is astoacetic acid, which is there in the serum, will interfere with the calorimetric assay of the serum creatinine. So sometimes you might have a false spurious high serum creatinine in these subset of patients. Okay, so that also we should keep in mind. So if the creatinine measurement is by enzymatic assays in your institution, so these things might not come into play, but if it is because of the calorimetric assays, so this also plays a role in your increase in the creatinine levels. So, any other uh, things which increases uh, during DK? What about the amylase and lipase levels in these subset of patients? False elevation can be seen. So, sorry? False elevation can be seen in DK as well. Sir. So, so Why? Not sure of the reason. Right. Yeah. Actually, it's a complex process. We don't know. But uh, probably the amylase uh, might be coming from the salivary glands. Uh, sometimes uh, these patients might also be having uh, concurrent, concurrent uh, alpha, I mean, pancreatitis as well. Pancreatitis might be the precipitating feature of uh, decay in these subset of patients, some of these patients. So amylase and lipase might also increase. So sometimes even without pancreatitis, they can increase. So we have to take this increase of amylase and lipase into the in a clinical context rather than the just few biochemical aspects. Okay, so, uh, so coming to the uh, diagnostic aspects, like if you see, like uh, you said, like sodium nitroprusside test, right? So, what is that sodium nitroprusside test you are doing? What does it detect? Only a stone and estoestic acids. Sir. Yeah, mainly estoestic acids and to a lesser extent a stone. Uh, it doesn't detect beta hydroxy butyrate, right? So, what is the disadvantage of that? Anyway, ketones, you have three ketones, any one it detects. So, what is the problem? Why are we so much concerned about it? Uh, beta hydroxy butyrate uh, starts to appear early and uh, it disappears uh, late, sir. And uh, when we only doing by only doing a urinary test, dipstick test, uh, we only measuring a stone and estoastic acid. Uh, beta hydroxy butyrate is not uh, diagnosed in dipstick test, so we have to rely on serum ketones rather than uh, urinary dipsticks. Actually, what you said is reverse. Beta hydroxy butyric acid is seen late in the disease process. So the initially, when you want to diagnose, you can diagnose with the urine dip tooth. That's not a problem because your astoacetic acid is very high initially. So sometimes the ratio might be almost like one is to one. But late in the disease process, what happens? The beta, beta hydroxy butyric acid concentration increases. The ratio might be to the extent of 10 is to one, 10, 10 of beta hydroxy butyric acid. So that will decrease uh, your uh, sensitivity of the nitroprusside test, causing what is known as a false negative test. Okay, so you should be aware of that. So, what is a true ketone here? True keto acid here? Beta hydroxy. No. Astroastic acid is the true keto acid. Actually, the acetone and beta hydroxy butyric acid are derived from acetoastic acid. Okay? Yes. So, do you have any false positive nitroprusside test? 
no idea sir yeah sometimes we do see when the patients are taking uh, uh, sulfhydryl groups uh, having uh, drugs containing sulfhydryl groups basically captopril uh, penicillamine i think mesna these are the some of the drugs which can give you false positive nitroprusside test but uh, most of the you know i think bedside ketones serum ketones what we measure they directly measure the beta hydroxybutyric acid so we may not encounter such problems right so uh, coming to the management actually goel sir uh, discussed with you in detail just uh, to add some of the things uh, so you said the fluid for the uh, treatment is uh, saline isotonic saline actually we can based on the uh, jama clinical trial uh, report sir we we can use uh, plasma light also when they compared now normal saline and plasma light uh, the much faster resolution of decay and uh, and uh, stopping of insulin uh, infusion also uh, early in case of uh, when we uh, fluid resisted with uh, uh, balancing sal- salt solutions uh, compared with the normal saline sir. okay okay that's good to know but uh, let's stick to the basics so what is that we are trying to do is we are trying to give isotonic saline right yes right so when you are trying to start isotonic saline uh, right you do give it right away or you do see one important uh, parameter chloride content uh... how will the chloride affect you we just look at the potassium value sir so uh, this uh, we can directly give a uh, sodium chloride bonus as we don't how is potassium related to isotonic so no, to add potassium into the mineral no, we will we will come to that potassium replacement okay we well, we are talking about saline just saline saline is the most important aspect right so what is the actually fluid deficit we have in this subset of patients nearly total total fluid deficit 6 to 8 liters of fluid deficit can be seen sir in case okay. uh, this patient requires a large volume of fluid resuscitation uh, if we are going with uh, normal saline uh, patient may develop hyperchloremic normal anion gap metabolic acidosis sir uh, that in turn uh, causes uh, kidney injury and uh, co- may increase the creatinine value sir that's why we are preferring our uh, 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 plasma light uh, i mean balanced salt solution uh, over uh, normal saline sir. okay let's okay. come to let's come to your balanced salt solution what is the sodium content of your balanced salt solution and what is the osmolality of your balanced salt solution close to 270 uh, 278 sir actually uh, and what very connected what we generally use and what, uh, what is the osmolality of normal saline 308 sir not right so what is the sodium content of your balanced salt solution 130 uh, one if i remember and uh, for uh, ns it's 154 so when even if you want to start balanced salt solution you want to see anything particularly before starting balanced salt solution or saline sodium exactly exactly that's why i'm saying don't go away from the basics we are not interested in you being the trial of sodium normal saline versus balanced salt solution causing ak okay we will discuss later but if you miss the basic thing if you don't see the sodium level before starting the uh, uh, in uh, saline or iv fluids that's not acceptable sodium levels are more important what about the sodium levels how do you monitor uh, dr vignesh serum uh, i didn't get the question sir how do we so what amount of sodium how is sodium uh, you know uh, interfering with your saline infusion sodium levels of the body interfering with your sodium i mean with your uh, iv fluid level so one thing is already patient if is having hyponatremia giving more at rest and was in the condition and because already having hyperosmolar state that is going to worsen secondly this hyponatremia can be stand alone because of the volume depletion as well 
See, that's what basics are very important. What happens when the serum sodium is less than 135? What happens if the serum sodium is more than 135? Very simple basic. So if it is less than 135, you go on with normal salmon. If it is more than 135, you go on with uh, no, half normal saline. So, why, why this C? When you are trying to correct, you need to take, in, take into uh, consideration the osmolality you want to correct. Right? So, this is very important point where, and the basic point where you have to see before you correct, uh, give IV fluids. Right? So, let's come to the potassium. How do you correct the potassium and how potassium plays a role in resuscitation of decay patients? As we are giving uh, insulin infusion, sir, insulin. So uh, if, we, if, if we can go back to the slides, uh, if we can see the potassium. What is the potassium here? 0.1. So here the sodium is 139. What do you want to start, uh, Dr. Vignesh? Yeah, so that's it. That's very important point you have to see. Okay, here the potassium is 3.8. So, we have to how do, supplement. How do you start your IV fluid correction? Uh, we have to, uh, in case of uh, potassium value is more, less than 3.3, .3, we have to first supplement with uh, potassium, sir, 40 milliequivalents, sir. Uh, more than 40 milliequivalents actually needed. In case uh, patient uh, potassium value is 3.3 to 4, and uh, we have to add around 4, 40 milliequivalents in each fluid, each bottle. And uh, if it is more than 4, we have to add only 20 milliequivalents of uh, potassium. If it is more than 5, we don't need to add a potassium uh, potassium to the fluid itself. Yeah, that's, what it, that's why your electrolytes are very really important in your evaluation, right? So why? Because your fluid resuscitation is dependent on your sodium and potassium levels. If your potassium is less than 3.3, do you give insulin? No, sir. We correct the potassium first then. Exactly. Why? Insulin mobilizes the extracellular potassium to intracellular potassium. It further worsens the hypokalemia. So what happens? Arrhythmias. Arrhythmias is possible. So that's very important. So potassium levels are very important. So if your potassium is less than 3.3, .3, your management changes. If your potassium is between 3.3 .3 to 5.3, you for management the changes, you add potassium. If your potassium is more than 5.3, you don't need to add potassium. And you can continue with your IV fluid correction. Correct. So what else do you correct? How much insulin you give for this subset of patients? Uh, 0.1 units per kg bolus followed by 0.1 units per kg infusion. Uh, based upon the insulin uh, sugar values, uh, we, by targeting around 50 to 75 milligrams per uh, uh, change per hour. And if it is more than 100, uh, we have to reduce the dose to half. Uh, if it is less than 50, uh, less than 50 change, we have to increase by 50% 50, 50 of the bol baseline bolus. Uh, yes. What type of insulin you use? Uh, human atropid insulin. Uh, regular insulin. Regular right. insulin. Regular right. insulin we use. Right. So, <clears throat> any role of insulin analogs in these patients, in this subset of patients? We can even give a basal insulin uh, dosage, sir, actually. Uh, it has also been uh, practiced. Patient who is on already on insulin on the background of type 1 diabetes patients is coming to presenting with PKA. We can give a basal dosage on top of the basal dosage. We can titrate the sugars with the IV as well. So, there is no difference between a regular insulin and a baseline insulin analogs like ASPAD. Uh, so, the uh, using of regular insulin is good enough. Uh, regarding your basal insulin, like you said, uh, addition of a basal in insulin will help in diabetes control, but not definitely in the initial stage when the patient is having severe metabolic acidosis. 
And uh, what basal insulin can you add, uh, Atul Nish? Glargin, uh, long acting insulin. Long acting. Want to add uh, Degludec? Sharp. It's also like Lantus. I'm not sure. Yeah. So the new drugs yeah. they have come. You should know about little bit about that. Yes. So see, the Degludec is ultra long acting uh, insulin. So for it to come to normal plasma levels, it takes four days. So we should not use uh, ultra long acting uh, insulins uh, in this uh, subset of patients, especially the patient is in diabetic ketosis. So now we see the pH is around uh, 7.1, right? Very severe metabolic acidosis. Want to give bicarbonate in this subset of patient? No, sir. No. Why? Because uh, bicarbonate corrects my pH. It will be 7.3. Now it will be out of danger. Patient will be out of danger. Uh, the problem here, sir, uh, sodium overload and volume overload and uh, ketogenesis also increases with the uh, uh, soda bicarb infusion. And uh, uh, potassium abnormality is also common with the alkalosis, uh, which is uh, uh, secondary to bicarb infusion. Sir. And intracellular SOS is also uh, increase uh, problem with the soda bicarb infusions. Another main problem is we are using anemia closer as a cutoff to stop insulin. And in this case, we started using soda bicarb as well, that even hampers the value. Then, since we don't have a uh, blood ketone measurement that is going to again. So let's do. Yeah. Sorry, sir. No, no, please continue, sir. Let's assume the pH is 6.8 here. What do you want to do? Uh, in that situation, 5200 uh, uh, soda bicarb can be tried, sir, uh, to correct the severe acidosis, uh, life threatening acidosis. Can be given. Can be yep. given. Yeah, yeah. Only, only if it is less than 6.9, otherwise the role of bicarbonate is absolute in the subset of patients. Like you said, we are, we are dependent on the anion gap. That's, that's uh, I mean, we don't know what anion gap we are correcting. And also the intracellular aspects, especially in the brain, which may cause sometimes uh, cerebral edema uh, in the subset of patients. Okay. So, so, Dr. Vignesh, sorry, sorry to interrupt yes, in between. Dr. Uday, Dr. Vignesh, can you describe this ABG? When you show this first slide, that time I, I was like uh, trying to ask, but like couldn't ask that time. So, just describe the ABG. Uh, so, uh, this ABG is showing a severe metabolic acidosis uh, with uh, so pH of 7.10 and a PCO2 of 30 and a PO2 of no, 9. No, yes. AC, uh, ABG description does not mean that you read out the data. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, high ending of metabolic acidosis uh, with uh, uncompensated respiratory. Uh, uncom it's not an uncompensated, it's an uncompensated. Uh, it's compensated or uncompensated? Uh, expected uh, PCO2 value is uh, 28, sir. And the patient uh, had fatigue uh, by then uh, when we are taking ABG. That's why patient had a PCO2 value of 40. And uh, so looking at this uh, pH, you have left patient like that only with without any support. We had a close monitoring of this patient. Mm -hmm. So the patient was uh, didn't complain of uh, discomfort though he's having respiratory of the nose. So we didn't uh, support him at this oh, point. How much respiratory comfort do you want? His respiratory rate, her respiratory rate was 34 already. Yes, so with 34 respiratory rate, PCO2 of 40 is a, a very dicey situation. Yes, sir. You are just sitting on an impending arrest. As you have rightly said, the compensation should have been somewhere around in 20s. Okay. Anything else, Dr. Ravani? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, so, like, let's I would go have to... suggested that this pH and this PCO2, some sort of support should have been given. Yes. I would say this patient is an impending failure, respiratory failure. He's already fatigued. That is why her PCO2 is rising. 
so maybe niv it depends on the clinical picture we are just looking at the numbers but if patient is still having vomiting then i might not go for niv otherwise probably i would have gone for niv yes sir sorry yes sir uh, sorry and as a goin sir rightly pointed out if this patient is having an additional respiratory asphyxia as well because the compensation comes around 34 to 36 so additional uh, respiratory so we need to pick up these uh, patients because like goin sir said aplip said that uh, you know these patients can uh, we are sitting on a ticking time bomb in this subset of patients probably you know supporting him with uh, some niv or uh, uh, intubation is very much uh, needed in this patient so uh, coming to our dk uh, i think uh, we are coming to the end any complications during treatment you can encounter uh, in this subset of patients uh cerebral edema is a possibility sir because of rapid corrections of uh, asthma lalli and uh, sugar values so so we have to titrate the sugar uh, correction uh, uh, as a major determinant of this uh, uh, asthma lalli so we have to titrate around 5 to 50 to 75 correction not more than that uh, and also we have to closely monitor the sodium values also sir uh, asthma lalli is the key role in uh, titrating the Uh, treating the patient of DK. So that's why your sodium is very important when you are starting your IV fluids. Now you understand. Yes. So so much is related to it. So uh, uh, how many patients have you seen going into cerebral edema? No, I haven't seen any. No, no. Yeah, that's because uh, we follow the protocol. Number one, number two is it's very less in adult patients, more so in uh, no pediatric dk patients so the adaptations are bit little less in the subset of patients so pediatric patients do develop uh, cerebral edema at a faster rate than compared to adults so let's go to mucor because this yeah the thing yeah. is about a uh, little bit about mucor also so like what do you think are the risk factor in this subset of patients why this patient had uh, mucor mycosis risk factors for mucor mycosis were uh, uncontrolled sugar sir the previous history of uh, immunosuppressive medication uh, dr uday always when an examiner asks you a question try to listen to the question properly i said in this patient patient is having dk that itself is a high risk factor for a patient having mucor and diabetic background history of covid as well so no the right answer i would say poorly controlled diabetes is a risk factor dk cannot be risk factor in two days or three days uh, it is very unlikely that mucor has occurred patient must have exposed to the mucor for a some time she might be having little bit of exposure and with poorly controlled diabetes it will be it invasion cannot happen in a day one or day two that's exactly the point yeah so we should not be carried away by whatever uh, the history is there so goins have pointedly pointed out diabetes is the predominant cause of dk even before covid existed there was mucor and the predominant cause of mucor in this subset of patients was diabetes mucor precedes dk but dk doesn't cause mucor that's one thing which you need to uh, understand at this point of time okay so any other risk factors for uh, uh, you know mucor apart from diabetes agreed diabetes is the predominant cause uh the uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients acute leukemia so solid organ transplant patients and those right. who are on yeah. immunosuppressive medications sir. and uh, right steroids yes sir. And sorry steroids okay steroids and uh, co- uh, recent uh, covid uh, immunomodulation uh, because of covid infection and uh, uh, use of uh, industrial oxygen and uh, no, we will not go more into it because what causes mucor mycosis in covid is a different topic and i think dr venkat has covered extensively in previous discussions okay uh, apart from that uh, any other thing i think you see in uh, pediatric patients I am not. Congenital immunodeficiency. 
you see iron ore load in which patients thalassemia patients thalassemia patients thalassemia patients treated with iron ore load iron ore peroxamine is the predominant cause for uh, your uh, uh, you know development of uh, this one so what do you think this patient had in the sense like you said that you have shown a mri i, I suppose it's an mri image yes uh, so you shown an mri image and there was an infarct in the pons what were you trying to show us what is the presentation of mucor in this patient initial presentation were uh, nasal blockade and right sided uh, facial pain and uh, uh, right orbit uh, right eye pain sir initial symptoms sir. and uh, and uh, initial uh, imaging also uh, suggestive of uh, sinusitis picture and uh, uh, after surgery patient uh, developed uh, pro progressed uh, to uh, rhinocerebral uh, mucor invasive extensive mucor mycosis so it's more of a rhino rhino orbito mucor mycosis so which is involving all the three structures which is more common with mucor mycosis so i mean i am happy that you have sent that patient to rehab but the mortality of rhino orbital cerebral mucor mycosis is as high as 100% it's very high 90% Uh, yeah, good. So, uh, Milker said this patient was sent to rehab, but for how long would you like to give encotericin B? When to switch over to other drug, or would you like to start do two drug regimen or not? So there are three questions. The duration of therapy is one. When to switch from uh, lipo? Uh, like you are giving five hundred milligram of liposomal encotericin B. Just imagine the cost. Five so, hundred milligram means almost a one lakh rupees a day, maybe eighty thousand a day, because you will need some other paraphernalia also, dextrose, IV drip, blah blah blah, so many things. So that when much cost, I think in India very few people can afford. So duration, when to switch to the other thing, and when you use two drug regimen. after 4 to 6 weeks of therapy the patient has to be reevaluated sir and look for whether the patient is uh, progressing or the progression has been arrested if the patient is still progressing then the patient so how will you judge the progress what is the parameter of progress uh, repeat imaging or even uh, patient may even require a redo surgery to evaluate sir the redo surgery after imaging i have very clear that how will you judge the progress redo surgery is other thing when you feel that patient is not progressing so for imaging is the main thing with imaging and comparing you will see but for that we need to have a post op image otherwise how will i come to know whatever surgeon has left by the first, after the first surgery so before shifting to such patients for a long term care we should have, have a imaging also so that we know exactly that how much surgeon has removed and how much is left it is quite possible that in a surgery he might have left a little bit of the pieces there and in successive imaging we thought we we might think that they are the new development so 4 to 6 weeks or 4 to 6 months 6 weeks is 6 weeks is a one and a half month only for uncomplicated infections uh, for this patient your rehab team is asking you to please review this patient this patient now cannot afford 1 lakh rupees per day medicine uh, next options for uh, isoconazole and posoconazole oral therapy can be tried sir but uh, cns uh, penetration is very poor for this patient with these drugs uh, as patient already developed the uh, uh, pontine infarcts so the only option is liposomal amputation b for in this patients why not deoxycholate again same question can be tried sir uh, deoxycholate can be tried but uh, cns penetration comparatively to can it be given in uh, through lumbar puncture in csf yes sir amputation uh, deoxycholate can be given even to lumbar puncture It will save lot of cost. 
can you tell me the dose i think it's 0.1 mg sir i'm not sure though it's 0.1 mg and routine dose iv dose iv dose will be 0.1 mg per kg of the same thing will be 0.2 iv dose sir uh, for a cerebral fever it will be uh, up to 1.5 mg can do okay 0.5 to 1.5 is a cerebral uh, Uh, just please cross check even i don't remember the dose exactly so yes. please 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 cross check so that if somewhere somebody asks you know the exact dose yes and what about when like to start dual therapy if there is progression in the repeat mri then uh, we have to start the patient on dual therapy with amprolysin and isavuconazole uh, or prostaglandin Mm-hmm. Yeah, but why we want to go for isavuconazole and um, tocilizumab? Why can't we start second drug with along with this uh, amphotericin B? Amphotericin B with isavuconazole or tocilizumab? Okay, probably I will go for tocilizumab. The cost is little less than isavuconazole. Isavuconazole is further costly drug. what is the role of uh, combining ikinocandin with amphotericin b there were few papers before isavuconazole many people used to use the ikinocandin as well but i think after coming tocilizumab uh, after coming isavuconazole that practice i don't know have you gone through any such study or paper just asking It may not be mandatory for your course I didn't find out any combination. Well, there were some benefits. Sir. Yeah, there for mucus there were some case reports, and uh, I remember because even our ID people five years back they support suggested those combinations. That time, if sabuconazole was not there. Uh, Doctor Bhavani, anything else would you like? Yes, sir. Last uh, couple of questions uh, I would like to add. Uh, yeah, I think uh, when. Uh, Govind sir rightly pointed out uh, the duration of treatment is very important. We send the patient to rehab. Rehab doesn't have the responsibility of continuing the uh, how many days the antibiotic need to go. So you have to write in your orders uh, when you need to stop the amphotericin B and when to stop when to restart the uh, posaconazole or isoconazole according to what is the requirement. so that that's that's a very good point that that goel sir has pointed out and uh, uh, <clears throat> so this iv amphotericin b needs to be continued almost like till the patient becomes stable once the patient stable then we can switch over to isoconazole or posoconazole uh, isoconazole is a new drug and uh, most probably we are waiting for the idsa guidelines uh, which was last released in 2016 most probably we are hoping that uh, it, it gets released this year or maybe next year so we may get more information and more indications of isoconazole because isoconazole was a new drug which was not there when it was released in 2016 so after that many that many trials many data are there on isoconazole probably we will get more information uh, regarding isoconazole uh, any other uh, like uh, goel sir was actually pointing out that why deoxycholate cannot be used actually in one situation where we have to use only deoxycholate we'll come to that before that uh, any other mycormycosis related uh, infections we can see like we are commonly seeing only the rhino orbital cerebral mycormycosis any other uh, mycormycosis we you know about pulmonary and uh... Gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal. Correct. Pulmonary infection. I would add one more as renal. Exactly. I remember eight or ten years back there was a young boy shifted from Srinagar with uh, wake abdomen pain and uh, renal shutdown. And he was having abdomen pain, signs of peritoneal uh, this peritonitis. Opened up. There was a. Um, uh, this perforation and gangrene they removed the gangrene and during that process they saw the kidney and they realized that kidneys are almost gone they are black color kidneys and they took a biopsy and it took out to be mucormycosis within 2 days that chap died young boy maybe 26 or 28 
so i have seen two cases of renal two or three cases after that we have seen one or two cases four yeah, yes sir that's a very interesting case uh, yeah actually in uh, renal mucormycosis uh, i mean this is all uh, i mean according to literature we have not seen um, the penetration of uh liposomal amphotericin b is very less so in these subset of patients we need to use only the deoxycodone uh, so that is what you were pointing out that there is one situation where only deoxycodone yes sir yes sir yeah, that's so that's one thing so i have seen one uh, uh, we have seen one uh, gi mycormycosis a patient is a known case of rheumatoid arthritis and uh, disease modifying drugs patient has a severe abdominal pain presented with severe abdominal pain and uh, so the ct abdomen was not suggestive of any specific finding so as a diagnostic laparotomy the surgeon went inside couldn't find anything except little bit of hyperemic bowels with small uh, uh, you know coin shape or size uh, lesions uh actually uh, they closed down the abdomen without you know uh, doing the biopsy of the patients and uh, after 3 days patient had uh, feces from the uh, uh, drains yeah. so when they reopened again it was a perforation and then the biopsy was sent and the biopsy was showing uh, mycormycosis and the patient ultimately died in 2 days after the second operation so this is one uh, experience regarding uh, gastrointestinal mycormycosis uh, from our side i think uh, sir if you are done i think we can close this session uh, yeah i am done and i must thank you dr bhavani for many new insights i have also learned few things and uh, thank you very much for a great discussion yeah thank you sir thank you goel sir it's always a pleasure to you know uh, you know moderate along with you and uh, it was a great discussion we had thank you govind sir um, it was always a pleasure to have you on board and uh, uh, interacting with the students and thank you bhavani for that um, extensive insight into the whole topic uh, so i thank both uday and vignesh also sasi you are there thank you sir thank you sir for the discussion so thank you for all those participants sir it will be useful most of the times uh we see a part of the participants uh, join today but we circulate this on youtube and also whatsapp on a time sir so that the students get benefit out of this and we are coming back with another six month schedule sir the cases which are pending will go ahead so all the students who uh, probably uh, are able to participate and uh, also see the later are feeling that's one of the useful platform so thank you all for joining and helping us thank you thank you very much <laughs> Thank you. I conclude the session. Thanks. Thank you, sir.